Our first question, please. John Taylor. After such appalling atrocities, why do the United Nations, the West, Russia and China not intervene to help the Syrian people? Douglas Murray. Well, uh, I, the last person to think that whatever would happen or whatever should happen in Syria could or would ever be simple. It's a very complex situation. I think that goes without saying. What's simple about it, what is straightforward, it comes back to the question on why the UN, uh, particularly Russia and China you mentioned, will not do anything. I'm afraid that's very straightforward. The UN Security Council cannot work, does not work in a case like this. Every actor involved knows that it does not and cannot work. The UN Security Council will not come up with a resolution because Russia and China have no reason to have a resolution suggesting UN action in Syria because of their business interests there, because of their serious holdings within that area, and for many other issues of real politic for them. So when people say we must rely on the UN, they must be aware that the UN cannot solve this problem. The question then comes back to whether or not a country like this one can do anything. And I have to say that uh, of the options before us, as I said, there are no simple ones. There are things we could think of doing, such as helping an international force to have a no-fly zone, stopping the use of helicopter gunships over areas that Assad's forces have been in. But none of it is, is, is straightforward. And I just add one other thing. I do wish, when discussing this, that uh, our politicians, I'm not thinking of the ones on this panel, but that our politicians in this country were a bit more frank with the people about this. Because in recent days, both William Hague and David Cameron have decried, and rightly decried, the atrocities in Syria. But it's no good just continuing to decry them. You have to say what you would do. And the fact is, if we cannot as a country any longer be the sort of country that can express and defend our values, including innocent civilian life, including defending innocent civilian life, if we cannot do that anymore, then I wish we'd just say so and not go through the pretense that we, we care about this and we'd like to do something, but perhaps the UN can do something, because that is simply a road to nothing. So should, should we crisis. swallow, should the West swallow its dislike of Iran and say, if Kofi Annan is as wise as everyone says well, he is, I, Iran I, should be part of this? I personally think it's very difficult to leave Iran out of this. They are a major player and it's very difficult to ignore them. And if we want to have a contact group that leads to the implementation of the Anand plan, I don't think you can ignore uh, Iran as part of that. David Davis. I agree. The simple truth is that you have to have every neighboring nation involved. Whether you like it or not, where are the refugees going to flee to? How are you going to provide no-fly zones if you are going to do that? How are you going to provide sanctuary for the people who will otherwise be killed in genocides? The way to do it is involve every local nation, and that includes Iran. But, but Iran is currently not only uh, arming and sending troops to help the Assad regime, but is now boasting that it is doing so under the eyes of the UN, under the eyes of the international community. To, in, to, to involve Iran as, as if Iran can help this process is like asking an arsonist to come into a burning building. But uh, Douglas, isn't uh, Saudi Arabia similarly... Uh, arming the it, it, opposition, it, 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 and it, it, should they therefore be excluded? It, it, don't, don't you start then excluding all the neighbouring countries? You, you, you could do. I think, simply think that in the region, the destabilising force is and has been for more than three decades now Iran, and that Iran, which props up the Assad regime and has done for so many years as this proxy state, which itself is also a terror sponsor. If you roll this problem back in Syria, you can roll it back straight to Tehran, and I think that there is a justifiable... Uh, uh, excuse for saying we should at least look at Iran as part of the problem. That is not to say you ignore them. It's not to say you, nobody ever speaks to them. But to see them as necessarily part of the solution, I think, is to get some of this. David Taylor. Should the Home Secretary poke a stick into the lion's den and appoint a former rail regulator with a non-police background to the post of HM Inspector of Constabulary? I think if you're being asked to do such a serious job as reform the police, of course it would be an advantage to have gone through those ranks, 
to have an understanding of what it actually takes. Because it's always painful to reform, to change ways that have been set. So if you want to make that as smooth and as efficient as possible, if again, if your intention is to have a better police force because you believe some changes need happening, then surely you need some trust from the very people that you're asking to change. And by imposing somebody, and already the fact it's controversial, that's going to be a more difficult process, not an easier process. So I think this government's got it completely wrong on this. When you think, I mean, to, to use a, a phrase away, you, you think if you want to have radical reform, it's better to set a copper to catch a copper than it is to have an outsider to catch the copper. But it's about making sure that that change is real and deep and not just some superficial cosmopolitan change and to, to grab a few headlines, uh, but actually doesn't mean a real change from top right down to the bottom. And I think people who have been through that process, who understand how it works, have the trust of the people who they're trying to lead, because it's a leadership role, ultimately, uh, and, and people don't like to be forced. And by having it done in that way, I think the changes would be more meaningful and more genuine. Douglas Murray. Well, sometimes uh, imposing somebody from outside, uh, as some put it, is the only way to uh, reform uh, some of these uh, uh, parts of the public sector. It's the same with aspects of the NHS and many other much beloved uh, parts of this country. We always hope that they can be reformed from within, but sometimes radical action is needed. Sometimes that is somebody being, uh, as, as Salman says, imposed from without. But, you know, one of the things that suggests to me this might not be such a bad thing are the number of vested interests that come straight out when, some of this, when something like this happens. Uh, there are a lot of people who would not want Tom Windsor to succeed in his task. Uh, David and indeed Alan know uh, that lie of the land on this uh, far better uh, than I do, but I just wanted to make one other point, which is this. Uh, when Alan says the police feel alienated now, Alan, that is not a new thing. That isn't something that's happened only since the coalition. The police in this country can be said to have felt alienated for many years now, and it's partly because there has been a complete breakdown between the public and the police in what the public expect of the police. One one week we expect them to go in and, and deal with rioters, and then another week there's a, an inquiry Actually, into it, and the police, uh, and the police are exposed the one way. Another time. week we say, why are the police not there? Another, why are there no, too many? Douglas, there it's the is first a breakdown. Time the police but... have had this gap between them and the government. I can't remember the last time the police went on their version of a strike. They can't go on an official strike, so on their holiday they actually joined in the protests against the government ago. cuts. Two years ago. It was simply two years ago when Jackie Smith was uh, Home Secretary. Okay. Philip Baldwin, are members of the panel concerned that a company which admits logistical mistakes in providing stewards for the Jubilee weekend has secured contracts to provide security for the Olympics? This company, uh, I think, is a reference to Close Protection UK, which has profusely apologised because two of its... Uh, uh, two or perhaps three of its volunteers, interns, however you want to describe them, arrived early on Saturday morning at 3 a.m. Um, rather than the 5 a.m. when they were expected and there were not appropriate provisions for them. Uh, Douglas Murray. Oh, I don't know. I've never heard of Close Protection UK till this week. I think it's always a bit bold to just decide what a company is and isn't fit for based on, frankly, as far as I can see, a couple of very alarmist newspaper headlines and a rather alarmist tweet from Mr Prescott. I <laughs> You wouldn't, you wouldn't know he's running for office, would you? <laughs> Me? No, no Prescott. No, no. Oh, God. <laughs> I had no idea I was running for office. No, um, um, no, no I'm, the, the problem with, with, with this story is, is that actually the moment you dig a little bit beneath it, uh, uh, you find that the story is very much different. I, I was reading today accounts of other people who were working for this organisation last weekend who, uh, who had a very uh, a nice day. They got some work experience and so on. So, you know, as ever, there's a sort of proxy war going on. And once again in this country, you know, it, it, it's, we always fight these things in completely the wrong way. I wish we'd have a grown-up discussion in this country about the nature of, uh, of work. I wish we'd have a grown-up discussion about the very, very real and serious societal issue we face with massive youth unemployment. You know, when you have youth unemployment like we have now, it very swiftly becomes a social issue. And, 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 and I just wish we would have the discussion about it, how we get young people into work, which will include people working for nothing for a few days or for a few weeks, it, getting work experience, getting things on their CV. It will involve that sometimes. But instead, once again in Britain, we have 
crappy class warfare from clapped out politicians instead of a real debate. <laughs> Selma Yapu. Well, uh, I'm trying not to reel from that crappy class warfare. <laughs> you know, as somebody who comes from Birmingham and as somebody who does know the problems of inner city areas, we're in a lovely rural area this evening, but actually there are divides in society. And actually, I think that's the taboo. That's not what is uh, talked about. We hear about big society and all of this. And you mentioned youth unemployment. Youth unemployment is increasing because of the measures of this government. Austerity is not working. Austerity was supposed to be the medicine, but actually it turned out to be a poison. We're seeing people laid off work. We're seeing people who want to work but can't find jobs, and yet then themselves are blamed as some kind of scroungers. And I find real issue with that. And then to call it class warfare when people who are it, feeling look, pain it class uh, protest about it. John Prescott tried to use the Queen's Jubilee to claim as if during the Queen's Jubilee an opportunity was being seized to simply exploit young people to work for free. That is, that is, a, low, that is a low discussion. We should have the discussion about not an anti this, this government or pro that government, but simply how we get young people into work. And it cannot be done by class warfare of the kind that you seem to find uh, appealing. Um, please don't put words in my mouth, and yeah, that does not help at all. Um, uh, for people who are standing up for people's dignity, don't call that class warfare. That's about standing up for people's dignity. On, on the people who want to have experience, that, fine. For that. This is not about saying people shouldn't have work experience. Who's going to argue against work experience? But when people are told you'll be paid X amount of money for going along and being a steward, and then find themselves having to stay the night in the outside under London Bridge time. without access to toilet facilities for 24 not even hours, what I, think it's, I think it's right that people are allowed but to have not dignity. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on, Let's Douglas. not make it about the Jubilee. This is about a company which was getting millions of pounds for stewarding, yet when it came to paying their workers, didn't. That's the issue here. So let's not conflate the issues in this rabble-rousing way. <laughs> is to find a way to encourage employers to take on young people because they're in the worst possible situation. Most people lose their job and find another job very quickly. If you've never had a job, you fall into that trap. You can't get any work because you haven't got experience and you can't get any experience because you can't find a job. That becomes institutionalised, it becomes generationalised and it is the most damaging, most corrosive effect on society. So, so, so let's... So the big, the big grown-up debate takes us back to the budget. There was nothing in the budget about youth mm -hmm. unemployment. There was nothing to encourage companies, and perhaps a national insurance holiday for taking on 18 to 24-year-olds. So employers are incentivised to do that. Perhaps, perhaps putting the tax on bankers' bonuses but, again but that Alan, provided the money Alan, to pay for the future job Alan, fund and will actually be please, able to create okay, more money to get young people into following, work. Let's make That's following the following agreement. Big grown Alan, up let's debate make, about youth, youth unemployment. Alan, in which case, let's make the following agreement. We, we all agree that some aspects of the banking sector went very, very bad and everybody has had to pay for it. Yes. But your government, the Labour government, when you came into power, had a, it received a situation where there were a balanced books, a balanced budget. And when you left, we were running a budget deficit Douglas, in this country of Douglas, £170 billion. Pounds. <laughs> <laughs> this is, that, that wasn't... This is, Alan, this that is really... Great. This is really... Uh, this is really strange and even perverse, because you'll remember Lehman Brothers collapsed. There was a global financial problem that this government didn't recognise. Nothing to do with international uh, politics was to do Anything with the fiscal with deficit. Your, now, your means, now, at the moment, ever? where okay. we're in a double-dip recession. Remember, this government inherited growth and delivered recession. They didn't inherit... Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, now. I'm sorry. They inherited... Sorry. Sorry. Can I... Can the, I fact, the fact is they inherited growth of 1.8%. They inherited but, growth and have delivered a recession. I know they act as if they on, inherited Alan, a recession and delivered growth. Alan, I get Elizabeth Vose, in light of the criticism of the BBC's coverage of last weekend's Jubilee Saribations, has the BBC indeed lost the plot? Douglas Murray. 
No, I don't think it's lost the plot, but I don't think it was by any means its finest hour. Um, um, I, I sh probably shouldn't say this on this show. I'll never be invited back. I simply turned over to Sky. And, um, I, 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 but I did, I, I, I did, I'm afraid, I, I, I didn't, I mean, I just, I think that generally, and it's not actually the BBC's fault alone, the BBC is in this terrible position, it is criticised whatever it does by somebody who says, you know, they're letting us down, they're doing worse than they've ever, there's always somebody who thinks that about the BBC. I just simply think that generally in the country at the moment, the BBC appears to have got the idea that a lot of people have got that we've become this sort of noddyish, childlike nation who need to be spoken to as if we're teenagers. And, and you know, you even saw it, I have to say, in the concert the next night, which I didn't watch on any channel. Nothing on earth can persuade me to watch Gary Barlow interviewing Cheryl Cole and then <laughs> watching, watching Cliff Richard try to sing. I just... I, I just and, 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 I, and I'm sorry, I have, I have nothing against any of those particular performances, but it is a very strange thing we have in Britain. It's, it's, it's a, we're not a grown-up society, it sometimes seems. We all have to pretend like we're kids. And apart from anything else, we're all going to work till we drop from now on, so we might as well grow up. <laughs> to next, please. Judith Graham. The little word fat is under fire this week. Does the panel think that adjectives should be banned because they might upset some people. Douglas Murray. I agree, but this comes back slightly to the point I was trying to make before. Why do people make up rules for children and enforce them? Because children don't know how to behave. Why do we treat adults differently? Because adults should know how to behave. So a child should be encouraged and indeed persuaded and sometimes forced not to be unpleasant, not to be rude, not to be unpleasant to the fat kid in class, not to tease the child who they think is gay or they think is of a different race or a different religion, not to be rude to people for being different, but to be polite to people, to learn basic manners. When they become a grown-up, it's different. And the way in which we show disapproval when people are grown-up and are horrible is by societal disapproval. It's not by making laws, it's not by throwing people into prison or keeping them for detention if they've said the wrong thing about somebody. It's by expressing things as grown-ups. Very briefly, if I may, journalists get this all the time at the moment. A few years ago, I wrote a piece attacking a decision by a council in Kent to award... To, to, the, 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 somebody was awarded thousands of pounds of compensation because they were of Irish heritage and had heard a joke about an Irishman within hearing distance. And I wrote a piece at the time saying that it is absurd that somebody gets more money for facing an incoming joke in Kent than our soldiers do for an incoming bullet in Afghanistan. And I was then reporting to the police, among others, and the Press Complaints Commission, and others, for allegedly committing yet another offence. It, you become a one-man walking crime wave if you even talk about this, <laughs> this sort of area now. And, 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 and so the fact is we just have to grow up. Again, I plea to grow up and realise there's a difference between children and adults. Thank you. Philip Smith. Given that we're in a church dedicated to St Andrew, patron saint of Scotland, and Ed Miliband's article and speech on Englishness, how would you describe your nationality? Douglas Murray? I consider myself British, and I'm always sad, I have to say, by how few people now do do that. I think the United Kingdom is being split up by petty nationalists, and I think it's one of the saddest things of my life. Uh, I would just add one other thing. I, I don't find it to do with, with, with pride. People often say, I feel pride in being English or pride in being Scottish. I, I feel very grateful. I feel very grateful to be British and to be able to say that I'm British, and I'm grateful that so many other people feel the ability to do that too, and I'm grateful that as a country we welcome people.